Hello guys and welcome to my channel. My name is David and this channel is gonna be all about bodybuilding and bringing you the best knowledge when it comes to building muscle. I'm not gonna lie, I am from Poland so it's extremely hard to reach out to the people outside of my country. So if you are from the United States or any country outside the Poland, please subscribe to my channel, please share this to your friends and basically help me share this information with everyone who is interested in it. Also, if you are from Europe and you like to support my channel and myself, please use the code Olszewski at www.propeptide.pl and order the best quality peptides. They are shipping it throughout Europe, so don't worry about it. And without further ado, let's get started. So, hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we have a very special i know of, 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 of with every of this i say that there is a special guest but today we have uh justin harris who is not only a one of the of the probably smarter guys in the industry when it comes to the to the nutrition stuff but also as you as he told me like a, i don't know two minutes ago he's a part polish so yeah, yeah. This, this my uh, my mother was Polish. Yeah, my my mother was Polish, and my great grandmother we called her Bachi, which like that's the Polish word for grandmother, I believe. She never even learned English, but I I used to know a bunch of little phrases. You know, I could talk to her about little things, ask her where things were, and you know, say you know, yak DJ, and she'd say Dami Bouge, and uh, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Today we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, the off season just because this is this is what we do lately. But if if uh, Justin gonna have some time in the future, uh, he probably gonna sh share with us some some knowledge about uh, the contest prep and uh, the, the diet stuffs uh, when it comes to the picking and stuff like that in the future. So uh, if you are not subscribing this channel, please do, especially if you are outside of, of my country of Poland, just because it's extremely hard to, to reach the, the, the guys outside of the, the Poland, the YouTube have crazy algorithms. Uh, yeah. They are not allowed to, to see uh, anything that's outside of U S if you are not living in U S so it's, yeah. it's a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, okay, because none just, of us speak a second language. Most of the world is pretty good about at least understanding a few words from a few languages. We, we can barely speak English. <laughs> if if it's okay for you, I uh, want to put it into the perspective. So today we're going to speak about a uh, very good uh, and short, of course, to 12 or uh, a decent uh, open guy. So let's say it's going to be someone between 220 to 60 pounds. So it's probably like a 100 to 120 kilos, something like that. Okay. And we're going to mm -hmm. assume that this guy, even though it's decent and he, ha he is obviously a, a, a very, very large individual. For some reason, he didn't have any diet, any training, any PEDS protocol, any supplements. And basically, he just wanted to uh, be be coaching by you. So mm -hmm. what are the first thing you're going to do with, with someone like that? Well, first, I need to see where their body fat range is at. The, the, the male body is most anabolic or, you know, you can build the most muscle at really a pretty low body fat percentage. It's about eight to twelve percent. That's natural, uh, you know, for, for producing your own testosterone. And in the eight to twelve percent range, your natural testosterone production is the highest. The aromatization to estrogen is lower, so you the testosterone you produce, you aromatize less of it to estrogen. Your insulin sensitivity is higher. Now, if you're on PEDs, that's actually probably even lower because what happens when you get really low in body fat, your natural testosterone production can decrease. But if if you're on PEDs, that doesn't really matter. So really you want someone, you know, in the six to 12% range and even lower if you can start at the start of the off season, because once you get above 12%, your progress is, is going to stall quite a bit. And you see this all the time and you no one ever stops to think about it. You know, everyone knows the term permabulkers or the guys in the gym who are 20% body fat and are on, on PEDs and 
uh, train hard every day and want to be a bodybuilder and month after month, year after year, never look different. And it's because they don't want to lose the size they have. So they never diet down, but because they're higher in body fat, they have trouble gaining size. You know, they're always getting, they're always having to worry about gyno because they aromatize more of the testosterone or the, uh, the uh, aromatiz aromatizing compounds they take to estrogen. Uh, their, their insulin sensitivity is lower. And so they, their body's fighting them to grow. So the first thing I would do is find out where their body fat is. And if I, if I am picking like an optimal off season and I'm, you know, someone we're, we're going to, we're going to add 25 pounds of muscle to someone who's already got a lot of muscle mass. What would we do for that is I would, whether or not they did a contest, I would want them to diet down to contest body fat levels before we started the off season. And so that, that's how we would start if we could. Okay, so the first thing is gonna probably gonna be a diet break, uh, diet uh, mini cut. Sorry for diet break. Yeah, break. yeah, yeah. Yeah, most for most people. Yeah, and and it's unfortunately for a lot of people, it's not even a mini cut. It's a full <laughs> three month cut, and you just have to do it because you no one wants to, and no one wants to stop make stop gaining for three months. But the thing is, if you don't do that, you are never going to make progress. You just aren't, and you know people. And we're, we're so thick headed and stubborn. And I did the same thing for my first eight years. You know, I wanted to gain, I wanted to be big and gain muscle. So I, I didn't want to take time for, away from that to, to lose size, to lose body fat. But, you know, I, my, my gains were really quick at first. And then for like years for, you know, probably four years, they almost, I did changed almost nothing. You know, I was, I don't know at the time, this is before I took any PEDs. I was 250 pounds, but you know, probably over 20% body fat. And, and I was, you know, I liked being over 250 pounds. And so I was over 250 pounds. Then the next year I was the same weight. And the next year I was the same weight. And the next year I was the same weight because I, my body wasn't able to grow. And so you have to do it. Anyone who's listening, it's, it doesn't work. Otherwise you can, I mean, you, unless you want to be, you know, like a, like a strong man or a power lifter and you don't care and you know, cause, cause body fat aids in strength. And so that's, that's another way you can get tricked because you'll get stronger because the body fat and all that, all that, that, that mass around the joints provides compression around the joints. You know, you're re if you're really thick and heavy, your bench press is stronger, even if your muscles aren't stronger. And so you can kind of trick yourself into thinking you're gaining muscle because you're able to get really strong. But, but you're not from a bodybuilding standpoint. So yeah, it's a, it, a lot of people, it's not even a mini cut. It's a full on three or four month diet. Okay. So let's assume that, that this guy is the do the job and he's, and let's say like a seven to 8% body fat, mm -hmm. fat, uh, fat range, but, but true 7%, mm -hmm. not like the, the, mm -hmm. He's he's yeah he's photo he's, photo uh, yeah. comparison on the on the Google seven uh, percent yeah. yeah yeah so what do you do um, when it comes to the training with with most of your guys I know that the training is is very like um, person dependent obviously but very, is there yeah. is there something that you're in the perfect environment like to like to do is it more volume training is it more like an intensity low volume training or it's maybe something like a rotation when when you do like a six with weeks of volume uh, and six week of uh, intensity or something like that like you said it's person dependent i what i personally like to do is slightly lower volume i like to lift heavy i like progressive overload i like that type of workouts where i have a my metric for progress each week is that i've I've made my muscles stronger. You can get tricked in that also because, you know, like on a squat, you can keep adding weight to your squat without actually working your quads more, the muscles of your legs. You know, if you widen your stance, you put the bar lower on your back, you know, you wear flatter soles on your shoes. There's all little, so it's, it's not just moving the weight through more weight through space. I want to move more weight because the muscle got stronger. That's how I like to do it. But like you said, it's person dependent. Now the diet is the diet. The best diet is the best diet. The training is different because you it's you get out of it what you put into it. So I might like that way of training. If you hate training that way and I make you train that way, you're not going to progress as fast because you're gonna you're not gonna enjoy the workouts. You're gonna dread going in. And so my view on the weight training is it's less uh, 
it's it's more finding what you are most excited to go to the gym and do because th there have been great bodybuilders that did very high volume you know like a jay cutler there have been mr mm -hmm. olympias that did very low volume like a dorian yates there have been bodybuilders that did body parts twice a week like a ronnie coleman you know and so there you know and you have guys who do very abbreviated uh programs that carry a ton of muscle size like a jordan peters sometimes does whole body, you know, in one workout. So there's all different ways to train. And so in my view, it's whatever you enjoy most, and then we'll build the diet around that. Okay, so uh, we we got the training set up. So the diet is going to be the, the, the like, uh, the, 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 the diet best, is everything. Yeah, yeah, the best, the best thing that you, you, you can ask, uh, Justin, probably just because yeah. you're sometimes it, when I listen how you speak about the diet, it, it is, it's, it seems to be, uh, like a pleasure topic for you. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very I, excited I, I, that I, that I can make you that pleasure yeah. and ask you about it. So tell me, uh, Uh, obviously, you say already that you like your your athletes to stay lean during the the mm -hmm. off season. So I'm not gonna ask about start. it. But okay, start. So not not uh, staying lean. It's not that obvious. So how mm -hmm. much do you you gonna you gonna push someone weight wise when it comes to the off season? We'll we'll push. So I don't push. I don't try to make them gain weight. I try to do two things generally. In their workouts, we have some metric for progress. For me, I like progressive overload. It's an easy thing to track that we're making progress. And so that's so you go into the gym and we see this progress and we do whatever we have to do to get, make that progress. If you do volume work, or it's a little bit harder, but we look for some metric of progress in the gym. And so your job is to get better in the gym, do, you know, doing our bodybuilding workouts. And then my job is to teach your body to eat more and more bodybuilding food, good, clean, whole chicken, rice, steak, potatoes, foods like that without getting fat. That's our goal. We don't try to gain weight. We try to increase the amount of calories you eat without getting fat. Now that's not going to happen. We can't be perfect. You are going to slowly add some body fat. And so, uh, which will I'll allow up until about a point, I don't give a body fat percentage. It's probably about 12% on the old caliper testing, which is probably 16 to 20% with like true hydrostatic testing. Uh, but the, uh, and e the way I just use, I, I measure it is that like visually, you know, when you're in a diet and you can tell when you're holding water from day to day, you're lean enough to see like I'm watery or I'm not watery. There's a point where you don't notice that where, you know, like you can't tell if your abs are washed out because you're watery or if you're just fat. If you, if you can't tell when you're watery, then you're, that's, the, that's too much body fat. And so that's kind of what our gauge is. And it's somewhere around like 12%, that old, old caliper testing. Okay. Okay. And the next question is going to be uh, just question, just to set up some standards for us. Uh, because every, uh, it seems like maybe not every, but, but different people count the macro different ways. So mm -hmm. for some, it's only, I know how you counted them, but I have yeah. to ask some people counting, for example, protein only from the direct sources. So the meats, the, mm -hmm. I don't know, the dairy, the, the, the supplements like isolite, uh, or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. And some people counted them from whole sources. So like a rice, pasta, potatoes, and stuff like that. How you count them? This is the first question. Yep. I only count the direct and I'll tell you why I, I'm counting everything. Everything counts. You have to count everything. The problem is we don't have the, the sufficient tools to accurately count that precisely. Now the food labels, uh, at least in the U S are only have to be accurate to about 20%. I mean, that's a huge difference, you know? So someone eating, uh, uh like 5,000 calories a day, There's a thousand calorie difference. They could they could measure it exactly and be off by a thousand calories. You know that's uh, uh what was that whole of eating of the bikini chick. That's a, that's 250 grams of carbs. You know they could be completely wrong by 250 grams of carbs worth of calories. And so the so and and the other thing I do is the reason I do that is because if you're if you're eating a chicken breast and it says. Uh, you know, ours is always listed per ounces. Most most areas listed per grams. But if, let's say you're, it says that your chicken breast is 24 grams of protein and two and a half grams of fat per three ounces. Uh, that doesn't mean 
it, that's exactly what it is. It was a living, breathing creature. You know, if we ate human meat and ground it up, it would be 85, 15 ground beef, ground human, 85% lean, 15% fat, because the average human is 15% body fat. That doesn't mean every human that's ever existed is exactly 15% body fat. And chicken and steak, they're no different. You, you know, some chickens are a little bit more muscular. And so you're, if you think it has 25 grams of protein and two and a half grams of fat, and that was a lean muscular chicken, it might only have one and a half grams of fat and 28 grams of protein, but you measured it the other way and the same way in the reverse. And so with that and the fact that they only have to be within 20% accuracy. So you look at a, like, a, a, tw like three ounces of chicken and you see 25 grams of protein, two and a half grams of fat. And then you look at uh, 96, 4% ground beef. And it says 23 grams of protein and four grams of fat. And so you think, well, the ground beef is, is fatter. That, ex that extra lean, gr lean ground beef isn't made in a pharmacy. You know, it's farmers just picking the lean cuts of meat. Yeah. And so if it was, if there was a particularly lean cow, you know, a grass fed cow, very lean, that might only be two and a half grams of fat per serving where, even though the label says four and the chicken you're eating that day, even though the label says two and a half might've been a little, it just sat in a cage. It didn't move. Maybe it was a little fattier of a chicken. And then that one's actually four grams. And so I don't see any value in measuring things just for the sake of measuring them when they're, when they're not accurate. It's like when I, you know, cause I used to be an engineer and uh, people would, I did, was a test engineer. And so I designed test cells to test, you know, different, you know, we, we did a uh, heavy duty truck transmissions and different test, different components. And so you'd get, uh, someone would want a, a test stand that would house a transmission or something. And they would do all these calculations in Excel, and then they'd send you the data over and they'd want the, they'd want the, the, the metal wall to be cut to machine to 10.3333322211, you know, to, and they'd give a thousand decimals because Excel gave a thousand decimals, which the, the last decimal is smaller than an atom, you know? And so you can't measure it just because Excel gave you that data doesn't mean it's true. And it's yeah. the same with food. So, so what I do is I just have them count the direct macros. And the reason is because aside from all the other stuff is people tend to eat the same foods. And so we just need to get you on a diet and your diet is going to be most of the same foods, mostly at the same time of day. And so your total calorie is going to fall like in a circle, <clears throat> you know, and we can just assume it's in the center, but some days it's on a little bit farther the edge, other days over here, you know, the calories are slightly different, but we know it's somewhere in the middle. And if you eat the same foods every day, if we're doing that and you're not gaining muscle, then we just add a few calories, whether or not we're, we get, you're, whether or not it's the exact correct calories that you're measuring doesn't matter. We knew that this diet that you're eating wasn't working. Now we've added calories. And so we'll start gaining size. So, you know, simplifies it way more, even though it's, it, so it really makes it, it sounds more complex, but it's much, much simpler. Yeah, I, I know that. I know that. But I, I have many times, uh, I have clients that they just, just can handle it. It's, it's yeah. like a, a mind blowing for them. This is like it's not accurate. It's it's so yeah. uh, so 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 hard for them to just just understand. Yeah, this and some concept. And some people just want to do want to measure it. And I'll say, fine, you know, I'll tell them, okay, just you then you measure every calorie. That's fine. Measure it. List it when you send in your check in. I'm not going to read it because I know when you put two thousand seven hundred forty three point two calories that you were somewhere between probably. 2,000 and 8,500 calories, somewhere yeah. in that range, whatever you tell me, that's fine. But you weren't at that number. You were somewhere in that range and you just, that's as accurate as you could be given because we don't have accurate tools. Okay. So right now I have to ask the golden question. Uh, today you, you actually uh, uh, talk about this topic. So, so it's going to be a fresh one in your mind. How many grams of of uh, like a kilo of the lean tissue you like to put your guys when it comes to the to the protein i i hope i say it correctly so how many yeah. grams of protein you're gonna you're gonna i have uh, to it's hard for kilos to the, to the man. yeah i'm not a huge protein guy i mean i i say i'm not a high protein guy but most of my guys are at least 250 grams of protein per day and you, uh, most and most of my bigger guys are 300 or more and some of them even 400 but I don't have an exact amount. And, and the, the way I view protein is this, there's our natural protein turnover. So repairing organ tissue, you know, you bump your 
you bump your leg into the chair and it's got to repair that tissue. You know, the normal protein turnover is probably, who knows, 50 to 100 grams a day. It's probably might even be less, but just be we're bigger people, let's say 50 to 100 grams. And so let's take the high end, 100 grams. And now if we just do mathematically, and I'll do it. Uh, so let's say we wanted to add 20 pounds of muscle in a year. Uh, if we want to add 20 pounds of muscle in a year, how many grams is that? Uh, one pound is uh, five, 443, 450. It's about one, one pound is about 500 grams. So 20 pounds is about, about 10,000 grams. So you convert about 10,000 grams of protein to muscle over a year to gain 20 pounds of muscle. Well, what's 10,000 divided by 365? That's only 27 grams. <laughs> so that means... To gain 20 pounds of muscle in a year, you only convert about one gram per hour of new protein to new muscle or 25 grams a day, basically. So if we say 100 grams for normal protein turnover, then to, to technically to gain a 20 pounds of muscle a year, we only need to eat 125 grams of protein. Now, we can't be sure that every bit of that protein is going to yeah. go to muscle growth. So we want to add a little bit extra. So maybe I'll double that, you know, and then you get about 250 and then we're safe. We're definitely getting enough protein uh, to cover protein turnover to, to synthesize more than enough muscle. And then, and then extra buffer room to make sure we're never not enough muscle. And then the rest of the job, rather than just throwing protein at the problem, because we protein only 25 grams of it can turn the muscle anyways in any day. So rather than just put more protein on the problem, let's be precise with fats and carbohydrates to make sure that 25 grams of protein does get turned into muscle. And that's what I really focus on, the carbohydrates. Okay, so I know that you are a big carb guy. So the first mm -hmm. question is going to be fats. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just right. because I know I know you like to use only the lean sources of meat yep. and uh, more more likely it's not going to be a, a huge amount of fats in your diets. But yeah huge it's very person dependent for some 50 grams of fats it's it's a huge amount for some mm -hmm. they try to eat nothing to to, to like added i say added fat of course not yeah. something mm -hmm. that you counted from i don't know oats or something like that but uh, first of all this is probably going to be a be a tricky one because the, the oats actually have like a seven grams of fats yeah, in, in yeah. them. So how do you count the fats and how many grams of fats you like to, to have your guys on? And, and this is person dependent. Like you said, I have one person who, one client who's 11 weeks out and he's adding, he's has as much as 30 grams of fat per meal right now. He's got, he's got uh, GI issues, Crohn's colitis, uh, and and I, I believe he has either candida or SIBO and has difficulty with carbohydrates. So we adjust the the fats quite a bit more than with him than I do in most of my clients. But most of my clients were pretty low fat. My protein sources are very low fat, which clients never like because they don't taste as good. But I the reason I do it is because it's more precise. When we we're only counting the protein from chicken, if there's hardly any fat, then that's easier to worry. We don't have much extra stuff to worry about, you know. If we're if I'm allowing a wide range of proteins, if I'm letting you eat ribeye steak one meal and chicken the next meal, the ribeye steak might have 50 grams of fat in, in the amounts we're having, and the ch the chicken breast might only have five the next meal. So now we obviously have to count that. If I keep all my proteins to very lean sources that have about the same amount of fat per serving, then we don't have to worry about it. It cancels out. And then I'll usually, most of my clients kind of, uh, I, I do my fats in 7, 10, 14, 17, and 21 gram increments, which sounds kind of weird because all my, my protein's always like 45 grams per meal, 50 grams per meal, 35 grams per meal. My carbs are always 100 grams per meal, 50 grams per meal, you know, 60 grams per meal, like round numbers. But the reason I do that with fats is uh, a tablespoon of oil is usually 14 grams of fat. So if I say 14 grams of fat, then that's obvious, a tablespoon of oil. Um, most avocados are about 20 grams of fat. So 10 grams of fat is about 10, a half an avocado. In that case, I'd re recommend you actually w weigh it out to make sure it's exactly 10 grams. But if you're on the road or something, we can do half an avocado and know we're pretty close to 10 grams, you know, and then seven grams of fat would be like a level scoop of natural peanut butter or almond butter, or, uh, like an, uh, I believe that's a eighth of a cup of, I think it's eighth of a cup, uh, eighth of a cup of, uh, almonds. And so my fats are always like seven, 10 or 14 grams. And so typically seven, like 
most guys will get seven grams in pretty much every meal on uh, medium day and low day, except maybe their post-workout meal where carbs are really high. Uh, and then sometimes they'll get 10 grams and some of the bigger guys will get 14 grams per meal. Okay. And most of the, uh, probably all of the fats are the, the MUFAs and PUFAs. Yes. It's not going to be like a saturated fats. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing because omega-6 fatty acids, like arachidonic acid, is, is really important for muscle growth. And, you know, those are the inflammatory fats, and muscle growth is actually an inflammatory process. But we're eating multiple pounds of meat per day, so we're getting saturated fat. Even though they're lean sources of meat, there's still a, lot, a decent amount of fat for the amount of food we're eating, you know? I mean, when, when you're eating 400 grams of protein, even if you're eating lean meat, there's still a good amount of fat in all of that. And so the, because I want, because one of the things I'm most proud of is I, I'm known for adding size on guys. No, my guys never stay in the same weight class. That's like what people do. do. They come to me, they're, they're middleweight. They want to move to light heavy. They're light heavy. They want to move to heavy. And that's so I, I have to put size on guys. Uh, but the risk of that is then I don't want my guys to die, you know, <laughs> you know, and I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've never had a client with a, with a major health issue. None of my clients have ever had kidney failure, any major health issue. And one of the things I think I, is, plays a role in that is because I have them really focus on omega-3 fatty acids and healthy fats. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I could potentially ask you about how many grams, but this is like a silly question just because the answer is going to be the rest. Yeah. If you, if you yeah. So, so, so it's not going to be uh, that question, but you are very well known from your, for some probably crazy carb cycling, just because yeah, yeah. The, the carbs on your, on your high days can be even like a thousand and more yep. grams for yeah. some. So, I'm actually working on making a t-shirt for the thousand gram club because yeah, yeah. I, Probably I have probably ten or twelve guys right now getting a thousand grams, and then a few of them are a thousand <laughs> grams three times per week right now. But yeah, that, and my high carb days are very high carb. Uh, can you can you always. can you uh, shortcut it uh, how how it's look like for for most of the guys? Your okay, so let, let's say we take uh, uh, maybe a a two hundred and fifteen pound bodybuilder or a two a two hundred pound bodybuilder who's been competing like a light heavyweight and he wants to move up to be a legitimate heavyweight we need to add 25 pounds of muscle uh, his diet would probably look like like six meals per day on low days which would be the days he doesn't train uh would probably be about 50 grams of protein per meal the first three meals of the day maybe 50 grams of carbs the last three meals maybe 35 grams of carbs the first three meals 10 grams of fat the last three meals 14 grams of fat and then on a medium day it would be 50 grams of protein again per meal. And then all his non-training meals, like the, the meals were not uh, pre or post-workout would be maybe 50 grams of carbs with 10 grams of added fat. And then pre and post-workout would be anywhere, depending on his metabolism, anywhere from 75 grams to 125 grams of carbs. Uh, and then intra-workout, depending on his metabolism, would be anywhere from 25 to 50 grams of carbs. So, so if he has a really high metabolism, he's going to have... 300 grams of carbs around training. And then in the other four meals, he'll only have 250 grams of total carbs. So 550 for the day. And there won't be usually any fat around training. If, if, if pre-workout carbs are only 75 grams of fat or protein, then I'll probably have them do seven grams of fat. Now on their high day, it'll look totally different. The protein will go down to probably only 35 grams per meal and carbs will be crazy anywhere from uh, probably 125 to 135 grams per meal in his regular meals. And then around training anywhere from 135 to 200 grams per meal. So if he has a really high metabolism, he would do 200 grams of carbs pre-workout, 50 grams intra-workout and 200 grams post-workout, and then 135 grams of carbs and four other meals for the day, which would be close to a thousand grams. I think that's like 890 or 920 or something. Okay, and one other things from me to your diet is that you allowed your guys in the high days to uh, make like a half of the carbs from the diet is, can can come from the more sugar. like uh, yeah. processed uh, sugars and stuff like that. So this is one that's gonna fill out your your message uh, box yeah. very quick, just because people yeah, yeah. like to eat like. Yeah, it's not magic. Yeah, I mean, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it's not magic. But if you're eating a thousand grams of carbs, ins and we're using insulin anyways, insulin spiked all day. 
So to, it's, it's silly to completely avoid sugars because it doesn't matter, you know. So if if I'm get letting you have, I let people have 50% of the carbs in every meal on high day come from sugary sources. And what I define as sugary sources is any carb source that's less than three grams of fat per 25 grams of carbs. So if you want to have a bagel, it's it's kind of things that taste a little better. Uh, it, now, I prefer that you use fruit and fruit juice because clients tend to do better. And it seems obvious, that, you, but but people don't think it, you know, you you when you eat the processed food, people complain that they feel inflamed, that they feel achy, that the high day is really hard. If they stick to fruit and fruit juice, they don't, but that doesn't taste as good. So they'll want to do the Rice Krispie treats and the, you know, the Lucky Charms. And, I, and I'm fine for 50% 50, 50 of the carbs, because if you do that, and we have a thousand grams of carb, you're still eating 500 grams of complex carbs. So yeah. that's going to, 500 grams of rice, of carbs from rice and potatoes is going to keep your you know blood sugar pretty stable throughout the day. So that sugar is going to get, not going to matter much. Yeah, this, this, this sugar stuff is always funny for me, just because people uh, are scared of, of eat any sugar and then add 60, 80, 100 grams of dextrose uh into yeah. workout so that's yeah. like yeah. that's the crazy well, the other thing, thing is you can, we you can't can we don't digest a complex carbohydrate the only thing that can enter the bloodstream yeah. is sugars so what whatever carb you're eating it turns into a sugar before it gets into your blood anyways yeah, that, and that's the benefit is that the complex carbs take a little time to turn to sugar so you don't get such an insulin spike but on high days we don't mind insulin and we actually use insulin yeah yeah, of course, no nobody says that the processed sugars are, are great for us, but but everything in the mod moderation, I think it's 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 okay. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and, and and this is a you know bodybuilding is a long sport. You, it takes a decade or more to reach your peak, you know, and so if if having some cocoa pebbles before and after a workout on one day a week allows you to eat perfect the rest of the week, you know, and be, over ten years, you know, because when you're young and you're first starting out and you think like, I don't care, I only eat, you know, I don't care what it tastes like. And you do for a little bit, you know, but you're not going to do that for 10 years without having a craving here and there. And so this avoids that. And so my guys don't have cravings. They don't have issues because I actually give a cheat meal on the last meal of the day on high day also. And most people in the off season, they don't even want it. They're, they're, they're stuffed and they got to eat cereal. So what do they care? You know, and that, that, that that's curious. <clears throat> you say it's like a very low fat on the on the high mm -hmm. uh, high days, mm -hmm. and then you do it uh, uh, the cheat meal. Mm -hmm. It's probably for most of the people gonna be something like a Five Guys, so it's probably gonna be like a mm -hmm. burger and fries, or or mm -hmm. even a sushi, which which is actually a very high fat. It's most yeah, of, most mostly of them, yeah, good fats, but spice, yeah, but spicy less fat, and stuff. yeah. So how how it works? Well, it, it, I mean, again, and it's not it's not magic, but people it's it's they're all thermodynamics you know people think like if you eat fat before bed you're going to store fat or if you eat fat with insulin you're going to store fat you're going to store fat if there's if you have more calories in your bloodstream than you burn off it gets stored that's all that's all that happens so all a calorie is is a measure, measure of energy so we don't don't think of calorie as anything special a calorie is just the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree celsius that's it so when you so you know like we measure like a uh, uh, propane torch in BTUs, you can measure that in calories. You measure a light in joules or kilowatts or anything like that. You can measure those in calories also. You, a gasoline, you can measure its energy output in, in calories. So just think of your body as a car and you fill it with gas and, and you drive until the gas runs out and that's it. And if you drive past the gas runs out, it, you would have to pull from a second gas tank to, to fuel it. And that would be like burning fat. If you fill more gas than your car burns, and you fill it up again before you run out, then that extra gas is going to spill over into a new gas tank. And that would be like body fat. So in the, but in the body, we don't have just one gas tank. We have three, we have a gas tank for body fat. We have a gas tank for carbohydrates, which is liver and muscle glycogen. And we have a gas tank for proteins, which is muscle and, and, and skeletal and uh, uh, cardiac and, and uh, smooth uh, intestinal muscle tissue. And so that's how we store those, our gas, we store, you know, and that that's all it is. And so it, it, like, there's nothing, People think, oh, I had insulin. I had a bunch of carbs. If you, yes, you're storing food. You're storing extra. If you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to store them no matter where they come from. And, that, and, and that's it. And, and so the reason I put the cheat meal on the last meal of the day on high day is because people eat less calories. If I give you a, if I give you a cheat meal on like a low day, when you're starving you, in the middle of the day, 
you're going to pig out. And not only that, you're not going to go back to your, your normal meal. If I let you eat meal two as a cheat meal, meal three, isn't going to be chicken and vegetables. You know, it turns the whole day turns into a cheat meal where what I do is by the time you get to the cheat meal, you've had like 850 grams of carbohydrates. Your stomach is so full. You're burping up, you know, your cereal you've been eating. You're you're stinking up the whole house with your farts. And then it's the last meal of the day. So now, so it's 9 p.m. You're not hungry. You know, you're not going to cheat that bad. You got to go to bed. So you can't cheat. You you can't stay up all night eating. You don't ruin the whole day. You're not hungry. So you don't, you know, and so that's really why I do it. I, I just found, I didn't do that for years and years and years. But over time, I found like there were common errors. If I gave someone a cheat meal, and it was any meal other than the last meal of the day, there was at least a 25% chance the whole rest of the day turned into a cheat meal. And then they they messaged me the next day. I'm sorry, coach. I just lost it. My brain wouldn't work. I, I blew the whole day. I'm so sorry. What do I do now? You know, or, or uh, if, if I put like a, uh, if I don't give them a cheat meal, they have one in either they, they lie about it and don't tell me, or they do tell me. And, that, and we find out that coach, I know low day is supposed to be my biggest fat burning day, but I, I broke down and I went to McDonald's and I ate 30,000 calories, you know, it's like, okay, well that ruined the whole day. And we weren't planning on it. This we plan and we know it's already kind of self-regulated that it, it's only, it can only be so bad of a cheat, you know, and then in contest prep, I keep that in if I can. And then if we're not progressing on track, I'll put a calorie limit on the cheat meal. And then eventually maybe like a macro limitation and then tell you to get, you know, certain foods, maybe only get eat spaghetti for your cheat meal. But, but as long as you're on track, I'll, I'll let you have that cheat meal. And, and some clients get it all the way until two weeks out. Yeah, this is, this is like, a, I think it's great, a great approach. Maybe not for, for everyone, just because some people are, are, uh, I find it that for some people it's better just to not cheat because if you if they have one meal, even every week, one meal every week, they just waiting for that day to come. They they do, and but I, but I, it I, keeps them. And from, I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> my no, it's, no, it's not. No, it's well. That's the thing. My job is to get you in shape, you know, and that's the big thing. Is the approach to that isn't always what's the most healthy or mentally healthy you know, and that is what happens. People wait all week, but they wait all week. And if I don't, and I found that if I didn't do that, what happened to, you know, the guys who are going to be like a top 10 Mr. Olympia competitor, they don't cheat. You don't have to worry about them. But most of your clients aren't that type of person. Most of your clients are normal people that aren't, you know, they're not superhumanly motivated. And so if I didn't give them the cheat meal, I just found that they were cheating. And worse, they would they would lie and not tell me about it. And so they send their check in and they're a bloated mess. And I say, uh, we are supposed to be in a 1500 calorie deficit. You should have lost two, three pounds of fat, probably four pounds when we add in water and you're up three pounds. This doesn't make any sense. Did you add more sodium? You know, we were supposed to be at 68 grams per day. You shouldn't be able to blow it up like this. What happened? Oh, I don't know, coach. I, you know, I swear I didn't do anything. And so what do I have to do? I have to assume that you didn't cheat. And now we have to cut calories even harder because you gained weight on this diet, which means next week's even harder for you to follow. And you cheat again because you couldn't, you couldn't stick with the last diet. And so now the next week you check in and you're bloated and you're watering. No coach. I swear I didn't cheat. I don't know why I keep gaining weight. Well, what can I do as a coach? I have to cut calories even further, which means you're going to cheat even more. And so this just, and it, it just happened too many times where I was like, I need a, I need a way where I can control this and make this a part of a diet. So this no longer becomes a variable that I don't know where now I know they're going to cheat because we know it's there. And I know it's limited because it's at the last meal of the day and they're they're the least hungry they'll be all week. And so I know that's in the diet every week. And so we don't have those unplanned cheats. I don't get those. So people stop checking in all bloated and watery and they don't lie about it. And then, and then if they do cheat another day in the week, they don't lie about it because they don't view as cheap meals. as so bad. They'll say, coach, I'm so sorry. It wasn't my high day. My wife really wanted to go out to dinner. You know, I tried to be smart with it, but I got a ribeye and then I just couldn't take it. And I had a chocolate cake and I said, so, okay, that's, that sucks. But then we, then we removed the cheat meal from high day that week. So just, <clears throat> Just to uh, put it into a perspective, so I assume that you are just taking an average of the uh, calorie intake from the week, mm-hmm. and then like adjust the 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 rest days in the in the week. So they're probably gonna eat less during yeah. the the week yep. just to yep. have that that cheat meal. 
Yeah. And so like if and uh, this the cheat meal replaces a high day meal. So the high day meal is already a very high calorie meal. You know, if it's a if if the cheat meal is replacing a meal that's 40 grams of protein and 125 grams of carbohydrates, you know, that's it's an 800 calorie meal, 900 calorie meal already. So if you eat a 1600 calorie cheat meal, you eat almost an entire large pepperoni pizza, you know, all you've done is add 700 calories. That's 100 calories per day. That, you know, and so we only have six weeks, six days of the week to adjust it. So I just have to have calories like 120 calories lower each day, which is barely noticeable. Yeah. It's not that big of a difference, you know. And so you yeah. get to have the cheat meal, and you, yes, you have to eat less the other days, but it's not that much less. Yeah, that's a, that's that's obvious. Okay, so just uh, we are on on a, on a subject of the of the the cheat meals and general like a uh, approach to to this and the mental health as well so what are the biggest mistakes that you are noticed that athletes make when it comes to the diet when it comes to the off season of course well off season it is there's less contest has way more mistakes and way more mental mistakes but off season it's it's not being a bodybuilder people thinking it's off season and, and thinking it's an excuse to eat garbage, you know, it just isn't, you know, and you will not, there, you won't, you, there's a, you, you could, you could see what, you know, Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler or Phil Heath, or, you know, you can see what big Ramy eats year round. You can see Nick Walker in the off season. You're not going to find him eating junk. You know, Every, you only get so many days to add muscle and you only get a few grams of protein synthesis a day. So the, the food matters matters more than anything else food is the biggest thing because you go to any gym every gym in the world guys are doing the same exercises there's only so many exercises bench press for chest you know lateral raise for shoulders so everyone's doing the same workout and most people are training pretty hard and no one looks good you know and then even worse a lot of people are taking anabolics or peds in the united states if you break it down it's about like one in every 20 to one in every 25 adult males like 18 to 44 or whatever, use antibiotics in any given year. The, one in 25, there's barely one in 25 people who go to the gym. So that means most of the men at the gym are taking something and they don't look like a bodybuilder. So what's the difference? Well, the bodybuilders eat like bodybuilders. So that's the biggest thing is thinking that you cannot eat like a bodybuilder. It just doesn't work. You can do it and that's fine. Just don't expect to be a good bodybuilder, you know, because it or the best you could be because you will not. Yeah, this is... A... This is like a like a perfect answer. I I just hope that people are gonna understand it someday. Yeah, they won't. They won't. No. But I could tell you right now, if 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 you're you get a bunch of like twenty two year old perma uh who like working out, and you put them in a circle, they're gonna talk about steroids. That's all yeah, they're gonna talk about. You get a bunch of pro bodybuilders in a circle, they're gonna talk about food. That's all they talk about. And it's it's like such a dichotomy, and it's so interesting to me because anytime because I'll. I'll be at the gym and I'll hear all these like young kids are, and the only questions they want to ask me is about steroids. And the only thing they want to talk about is that. And then I'll go like, we just did a photo shoot with John Rivas and uh, Salvi Salong and uh, Joe Seaman. Joe's a pro. We just took uh, uh, third or fourth at New York. He's a client. Uh, and, the, and the other two are, I'm hoping are going to turn professional at the North Americans in 11 weeks. All they talked about was food. You know, because Joe was dieting, they wanted to know about his diet. They, you know, all they all they talked about was making sure that we had, you know, is, is our food's coming. Do we have a meal plan planned? You know, where, you know, will we get food? You know, sent to us during the photo shoot. Do we have to order food? That's all. It's food, 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 food. And so I can't stress that yeah. enough. If you want to be a bodybuilder, you have to eat like a bodybuilder. You, you see, you see that on on the Instagram, like when you do the 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 Q and A uh, stuff, just because. 99% of the of the guys that asking of uh, the, the anabolic questions are the people who are not even look like they are working out. Yep. Yeah. And the the the, the silly question like the the, the CS the, the the more like, like a the, the funniest let me say like that thing is that they are all thinking that this is some magic protocol or something like that. Don't don't uh, get me wrong the, the anabolics are very important but yeah, yeah, when, yeah. You, when you look at the 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 stack of the of the pros it's the, it's all the same it doesn't yeah. matter well there's there's only like matter. 50 stuff there's only like 50 con i mean what yeah. is there like test devol deca eq etran mastron yeah. there's only you can almost count them on your fingers and toes there's not that many things you know and so there's just and uh yeah that that uh 
that all and the problem is is that the way because the sport takes so long you know it takes 10 years to really make your progress and there are well, the, the reason i think people can do that is because they do their first cycle and they think okay i'm gonna i'm gonna look like ronnie coleman in 12 weeks and they're so excited and they do their first little cycle and hardly anything happens and so rather than look at themselves and be like okay i need to clean up my diet they think well i need to take more and so the next cycle, they take more and they're still not Ronnie Coleman. And they're like, ah, man, it must be because I didn't try this. I haven't tried Anadrol yet. That's why, you know, Anadrol is the one that makes you huge. And so the next cycle, I try that and they don't, then they're still not huge, you know? And so then like, well, obviously it's GH. I haven't used GH. That's why I'm not huge, you know? So, so the next cycle, they add GH and they're still not huge. And they go, well, the pros are taking 15 IUs a day. That's why. So the next yeah. cycle, they use a, ton, a lot of GH and they still don't look. And then, then what, then, well, obviously it's insulin. I haven't been taking insulin with my GH. That's why I'm not huge yet. So then, but by the time you've done all that, it's taken eight years and so many people. And then finally they realize, okay, I've tried everything and I'm still not huge. I've tried everything except eating like a bodybuilder and some of them won't get it. And some of them won't, but you can drag yourself along for almost a decade lying to yourself because of that because of the, of the way it's set up like that jordan peters I, I i know that you're probably familiar who who is that oh he's one of my favorites yeah yeah sure. he 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 once said that uh, he don't even care what is in the syringe just fill yeah. up the milligrams for the for that week and yep. he was the same doesn't care no one cares what is in the syringe just injected yeah. and if the milligrams for the weekend are sufficient you're gonna grow yeah. and the people are just making this conjunction of a little bit of this a little bit of that and yeah. this adds to this and this is this, the people like, would, like people a, would blow, the, blow their mind people right. would get really angry with me because what i when i competed what i did is i used to get a big 100 100 milliliter vial and i just put all my stuff in it whatever i was going to take and it was usually like test and eq but sometimes like i maybe i had a bottle of mastron left over and so i just pushed that in and then that's all i would do and i just knew how many mls per week i took yeah. i didn't you know shake the bottle up pull it out I just, and i i know so people would ask what your cycle is and i'd be like i don't know i really don't know i know i take this i take whatever you know three mls three times a week or whatever it was when i was at my biggest you know and it was like of what and i'm like well there's test in there there's eq in there i think there's one bottle of duck in there i can't remember if i put that in it you know and they're like they won't they won't believe it and i'm like i'm taking a bunch of crap <laughs> you know i it just it doesn't matter like to, you don't have to be to the milligram like that it doesn't matter yeah but there are still guys who are gonna argue with you that cipionate is is, is they yeah. are feeling better <laughs> yeah. <in> it. <laughs> yeah definitely definitely yeah. fuller uh, more vascular yeah. and stuff like yeah, that it's the exact uh, same molecule doesn't matter that the lab is just changed the labels and it's yeah. always an antate but but the yeah. labels are yeah. just yeah different. exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay I, it's when, when people would talk about that i was because i could never tell like i never could tell the difference and like some things like you can tell with like trend but i could never tell they all just felt like yeah. metabolics to me this, when people talk the funny about, stuff I, i feel this Man, yeah, I, I, I will give everything for for that to I would once love, yeah. in once in my life just to feel it. Yeah, I never I, feel anything. Nothing. No. No. no I mean, you, you get stronger faster. You can eat more. You, but yeah, no, I never felt different. I know when people would talk about that, or they would act like they they knew what it like. Each compound made them feel different. I'm like, no, it does not. <laughs> You just make yeah, I've, I've just had a 10 milligrams of of uh, primal this week, and I started feel the notice already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Of it's, course, yeah. it's it's great stuff. It's a different time. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this stuff makes me more vascular. This stuff makes my shoulders rounder. <laughs> yeah, like, like they say uh, about the boldenum. Yeah, yeah. Some people are crazy hungry, and some have like a very like a bullish looking shoulders on on. Yeah. So it's... you know what's funny with that is I've seen that run the shoulders. gamut because there were never any real human studies on that. So no one knows what it's supposed to do. To like 25 years ago, when I first started out, no one would take it. You're like, oh, that's completely useless. Proviron does better than that. There's no point in taking it. It does absolutely nothing. And so no one would use it because everyone said it was worthless. And then, pe then people would say, well, it's not worthless. It's only good if you need to get your hunger up. It doesn't build any muscle, but it makes you more hungry. And then people would say, well, it does, you know, makes you more hungry and raise your red blood cells, but that's it. And now I'm seeing everyone say it gives you anxiety. 
And that just cracks me up because I'm like, for 25 years, I didn't hear that from a single human that it causes anxiety. Yeah. We're now, when a client, clients will type, you know, like, we'll ask, ask them about PDs and they'll be like, well, I can use anything except I can't use bold it, 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 It'll give me terrible anxiety. I know it. It's like, <laughs> I, up until like eight years ago, I never heard that from a single person. And now everyone's convinced that's all it does. I was like 25 years ago, people, people used to say it didn't do anything. Yeah, this is like, like trend. Someone inject like a 50 milligrams of trend every day and digestion goes to shit. But yeah. then like eat 100, 150 milligrams of Dibble during the, the Arnold area and they even don't know what, what the, the, the liver is. Yeah, and yeah. Not to mention that they, they are basically destroying it. And yeah. they are doing it whole year and doesn't even feel it. But right now it's immediately three days later the diarrhea like yeah. they, they they are yeah. all yellow and it's yeah. it's yeah. bad it's bad yeah. okay so i am not gonna ask you about the cheat meals because obviously you just you just tell everything about it but the mini cuts just just because right now the mini cuts i think it's uh it's like a for some it's like a cult it's almost like a religion yeah. I hate do mini cuts. The mini cuts. So, okay. So you are basically hate, answered the question. <laughs> yeah. I hate mini cuts. If you have the mini cut, then you didn't have a proper diet. You got too fat because you, it, most people are competing every year. You know, like most of my real serious. Now, if you, if you're not competing and you're not planning competing at all for, you know, four or five years, yes, you'll need to cut, but I will never do a mini cut. We're either, we're either going to get you shredded so that we can do a full rebound and full off season to make progress. And we're not going to waste time. I hate mini cuts. The, the benefit of getting really lean is that you get that, that rebound period after if you're, you know, if you're 6% body fat, you can gain like 20 pounds of fat and still be lean, you know? So you have a whole off season to gain a, you know, you, you can overeat, you can mismeasure the diet and gain 20 pounds of fat and still be lean. So we have a ton of room to gain muscle with a mini cut. All we did is we cut you down for six weeks. We get you barely lean enough to start off season again. But if we gain any fat, then we're back to being too fat again. And all we did was spend a month, month and a half, not making any progress. We barely improved your insulin sensitivity. We didn't do anything new. We, we can't get a rebound out of it to get that like accelerated growth you get after a contest. So that, to me, it's like, what was the point? If you're going to get lean, get lean. You know, like, I, I just hate waffling. Don't we, it, 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 like pick a direction and go until you've maxed out that direction. And then once you've maxed out that direction, then pick the new direction and, and follow that to completion. You know, because for some uh, people it's just semantics, you see, yeah. it's because I think that's, for, for, I, I think it's needed. It's needed when you are, for example, have a problem with your, with your appetite for a week, you can cut out the, the Oh, I get, okay. Of, yeah. And that, some people just, just, I utilize, like yeah, to, that's... yeah, like to call it for some reason, mini cut and they just do the mini cuts every five weeks or something like that but okay it's just like a re synthesize your appetite and yeah 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 i use stuff like yeah. that i i always see people talking about mini cuts like they want to do they want to diet for four weeks and i'm like oh, that's such a way no yeah, but we'll and, do and i and i'm asking if when i asking you i i i was meaning the the like you said the okay. mini cuts in in terms of bringing down the the fat but uh -huh. i think that people just just call it it like this because yeah, yeah. It, Doing a basically a one on the third of the cut every five weeks is pointless. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. But I will if someone like if we because appetite is a big thing we run into because I I push a lot of food through my guys and it's a lot of clean food so it's not the funnest food to eat. So what we'll do is one of the quickest ways and to get your appetite and it happens really quickly is we'll keep the diet the same on all your training days, but on your off days we'll just take carbs and fats really low. And that's usually within a week or two, that's enough to really kind of boost your appetite again. And so our total calorie cut for the week is not very high. You know, it's like a few hundred calories for the whole week. So you're not going to lose weight. It's not that much different. And we do it for two weeks. We've only cut, you know, like 800 calories total. So you haven't had enough calorie drop to really change your physique, but it, it usually does boost your appetite. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a great approach. I like to just cut a, a, a large amount of protein for a seven to 10 days. And that's, that's, that's sufficient for, for most, mm -hmm. most guys. Okay. So what about the cardio in the off season? Do you think that this is like a, something that we supposed to utilize 
whole year just for the heart health mm -hmm. and Not maybe even for heart some yeah, maybe some insulin sensitivity and stuff like that, or is not. not yes, necessary. I do, and I think that I think that one of the the, the second worst thing, other than being a perma bulker, that bodybuilders do, or or people who want to be bodybuilders do, is think that doing cardio will slow their gains. <laughs> it, like, go, it, it cracks me up because go talk to any average person, and they'd be like, "Why aren't you exercising?" And you're like, "Well, I don't want to exercise because I don't want to lose muscle." And they'd be like, "But exercise." That doesn't make any sense to me, you know, because normal people think like, well, if you're exercising, that's good for muscle, right? Only, only bodybuilders think like, if I if I take too many steps today, I'll lose all my muscle. So the opposite, I, I use high intensity interval training cardio uh, all year round in the off season. And I absolutely 100% guarantee to a man, 100% of people, this is one of the few things that's absolutely 100% true in all cases. If you do it, you will make more progress as far as muscle growth than if you don't. And the way I do my hit is different. I don't do like true hit. I do bodybuilder hit. And so like, like a, like a 20 rep set of squats or a 12 rep set of deadlifts, like some of the really harder high rep stuff we'll ever do as a bodybuilder, you know, uh, that takes about a minute, you know? And so my hit intervals are one minute on one minute light, one minute hard, one minute light. And the reason is, is because I don't want you, you're not a sprinter. So I don't want you trying to get your heart rate to 200, but I want you to be able to work really hard for a minute without getting completely out of breath. Because if you can't, then a 20 rep set of squat turns into a, is a lung failure exercise rather than a muscle failure exercise. And if your lungs are failing before your muscles, your muscles aren't going to grow as fast as they could. So, so that what I do is usually 12 minutes of hit, which is only six minutes of actual work about three times a week. And that's it. Just post workout, and I do one minute hard, one minute light for twelve minutes, three on, times a week. On any specific like, uh, I like the step mill. Okay. Yeah, I I just find the step mill seems to be the easiest to work hard, get your heart rate up, burn the most amount of calories without the the most taxing on your body. And that's another one that cracks me up. Is every guy who doesn't have any muscle, when I tell them that, they say, "I don't want to do the step mill. I don't want to lose my muscle. Yeah. I don't want my legs will get too small." And so I'll say, well, you know, Kai Green does 15 minutes of the step mill before every single workout he ever does, every workout. And he's got it in human legs. And I say, if you go watch The Cost of Redemption, and I could be wrong on this because it's been 20 years, but the same day that Ronnie Coleman does that 800 pound squat, two hours later, he goes, but he's at home and he's at his home gym and he does 45 minutes on the step mill in the off season on yeah. leg day, you know? But every, but every bodybuilder with no leg with 18 inch legs thinks if they take three steps on a step mill, their legs are going to shrink. No, your legs will get bigger. And, and, you know, like obviously trying to run marathons, isn't good for bodybuilding, but I'm asking you to do six hard minutes. That's basically six sets with no weight, <laughs> you know? So I think this is like, like an Arnold area, just, uh, era, just because uh, the Arnold once says that if you are don't have to run just walk if you don't yeah, have yeah. to walk yeah yeah and stuff like that so uh, people just just bear that in in their mind and for some reason they're scared of doing anything so probably yeah. some of the guys not even like uh, have a sex with their wives just because yeah yeah oh i'm sure yeah burn out. yeah yeah, oh, I've, yeah <laughs> people are crazy and you don't want to burn wasted calories you you know because you can only eat so much food but this is a very specific form this is going to make sure this makes your training better. So now when I ask you to do a 20 rep set of squats, you fail because your muscles failed, not because your lungs failed. So you're yeah. going to grow faster and your appetite will be better and your appetite will last deeper into the off season and you'll stay leaner so we can feed you more food. And all I'm asking you to do is six minutes. <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm asking, you know, like that's not a lot of work because humans were persistent hunters early on before, before we invented like bows or before, before we learned to ride horses, the way we hunted animals uh, was we chased them until they died of heat exhaustion because because human bipedal motion walking on two legs is very energy efficient it's more energy efficient than four legs we can't move you know we can't change direction as fast but if we're just following you it ca it takes less energy for us to walk five miles than an animal on four legs to watch walk five miles and also we sweat you know like a dog pants so they only they only release heat through their tongue so it's hard for them to get rid of heat in their body. We sweat over our entire body. And then on top of that, our bodies are built differently. We have a very high surface area to body volume ratio. You know, you look at like a Buffalo, they got all this volume, all this body producing all this heat, and they don't have very much surface area because their legs are skinny, you know, 
And yeah. so they got this whole torso making all this heat and only that little surface area to dissipate it. We're all surface area. We got small little bodies, so we don't produce much heat. And we got all this body to radiate heat off in, and we can sweat and we, and, our, and we walk very efficiently. So the way we hunted for most of human existence was literally we exercised so hard that the other animal died and then we finally ate. And so for guys to think like, like doing like five minutes of walking is going to lose muscle. When for most of human history, we, we walked for like seven hours in the scalding heat before we ever got to eat a single gram of protein and we survived. And for those who are crying that they are uh, getting fat too fast is just because they are not moving. The, yeah. the, like uh, the metabolism between the peoples are not that different. The, the no, only no, difference yeah. is, is like a need that, that, that we are yeah, actually yeah. doing. So if someone yeah, and just sits, to, that's... This is yeah, why you so can crazy. eat only like, uh, like a bag of rice and get fat. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it just cracks me up because I just I always picture like two bodybuilders sitting around talking about how they're afraid of exercising because th they'll lose muscle. And then I just I just picture like two two like obese ladies walking by and, and hearing like, well, exercise makes you lose muscle. That doesn't make any sense. You know, it's like only bodybuilders would think that. Yeah. Okay. We are briefly touched the subject of the PEDs, and basically we are all, we are both like uh, agree that this probably doesn't matter, but everyone has their preferences. So what are your like uh, first choices when it comes to the, to the UF season, which, which, the, mm -hmm. which compounds do you most likely tend to use with your guys? So I'll start with why I, I choose them. What I want out of the off season is we need a way we can get the most milligrams of anabolics through your body without side effects. The most milligrams without killing your appetite, with giving you getting you test flu, with making you feel achy, without making you feel lethargic. And so we have to do that. And we have to do all that with, with the least health negative effects so that when we get to contest, we can do the hard stuff, you know? So we need to, we need to take the most amount we can take. So provided that you don't kill your appetite, that you don't get lethargic, and that also that when contest prep comes, you're healthy enough to do the contest prep stuff, which, which is the harsher chemicals. And so what I like to do is only injectables, no orals, because orals tend to hurt, harm appetite. They tend to affect, you know, they affect liver value. They tend to hurt the blood pressure mo uh, more and the blood work more. So I, I say pick two, an two uh, injectables. First one should be testosterone. And the second one should be your anabolic of choice, which would be like primobolin or DACA or EQ. And I prefer primobolin because in my experience, you can take the total milligrams highest when you do a test in primobolin before any of those other effects come. And then what I find is there's a limit uh, somewhere between about two grams and three grams of total milligrams per week, people start getting those symptoms. You know, so like if you do like 500 milligrams of tests and 400 milligrams of primobolin, if you bump that to 750 test and 600 milligrams of primobolin, you can almost guarantee you're going to grow faster, you know, and then say you go to a thousand milligrams of tests and 800 milligrams of primobolin, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to grow faster. But now you get, now let's bump it to, let's say 1500 milligrams of tests and 1200 milligrams of primobolin. You no longer, you, you, you can't guarantee you'll grow faster. Most people probably still will. But a lot of people will now start getting things like test flu, they'll start losing their appetite, their blood pressure will get really high, they'll have, be, you know, they'll have no energy. And so if you have no energy, you feel like you have the flu and you can't eat, you know, if you can't train and you can't eat, you're not going to grow. So there's no, that, that no longer makes you grow faster. And so we just try to find that range. And then that's it. Uh, so you pick a test dose and you pick your favorite anabolic at about 75 to 80% of the test dose. And so okay. for most people, the, the peak best cycle at their best years is going to be like 1,200 milligrams of test and a gram of primobolin per week. Okay, and this is the question that is not on my list, but this is something that is like a very curious one for me lately, just because there is one guy who has like a very... Um, he he thought different than, than than everyone. So I I just started to ask the the other the other coaches about it. When is the time to to bump your anabolics the highest in the off season or in the contest prep? In, your in contest, one hundred percent for me. Okay, 
Okay, the guy is. Uh, uh, should I should I say it as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying it. John Jewett. John Jewett. I actually yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, doing, yeah. Doing his his course right now, and he is one that's big on the the lowest anabolics on the Condes prep. Yeah, like he he says that basically like there you don't have to you don't need much to just just like uh preserve your muscle. It's mm -hmm. it's more about uh, building muscle when you need the most. Yeah, I, I would the, my my argument against that would be that you're able to grow on lower doses when food volume and rest and recovery are are the highest. So that's why I do that in off season. And the reason why I want higher doses in contest prep is is multifold. One, you can build muscle in a calorie deficit with with very high end blood androgen levels, but especially why blood androgen levels are climbing. So every time you add a new compound in contest prep and your blood androgen levels are climbing, even in a calorie deficit, you can build muscle. And that seems counterintuitive because it, it you know, like how did, does that violate the law of conservation of energy? And it's like, no, it doesn't because those few calories that you're synthesizing as muscle now get pulled from another energy source, usually, usually fat. And so that's how like a Kevin Lebroni was able to make the transformations he made, you know? Yeah. So so I say, why would we waste that if we, if we can burn even more fat because some of that, because we're building some muscle. And so that net calorie change has to be equal. So that means we have to lose that amount of fat to keep, you know, to, to, to keep the conservation of energy. We, we want that. And then also, I don't mind the lower appetite, you know, late in prep, yeah. that's helpful because you're hungry. And so of if course. it kills your appetite a little bit, that's good. And it's not like a dramatic difference. It's not like I'm having people do like, you still like have that those issues. Like if you take too much, you're going to feel really crappy. But I tend to do, I do the harsher chemicals. I, the only time I do orals is in the prep and typically prep might not necessarily be more total milligrams per week. It might be, but it's not automatically, but there's definitely more compounds and there's definitely harsher compounds. Yeah. And then, and actually the, the, the fastest you'll ever grow as with me is the four to six weeks after a contest. And we, in that period, we only use about 60% of the dose we use in the off season at our peak off season. Yeah. So. Okay. I just, I just wanted to, to clear. Yeah, up. I know. I know. I, and I love, I like John's stuff and I, and I think John thinks things out. Yeah. Very that, well. that, that, I, that, I, that wasn't, if someone thinks that, that that wasn't the attack or, or, or on the John, he's a very smart guy. And I, 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 I'm very enjoyed the, the stuff that he's doing. I even trying to invite him, but he, for some reason, just not uh, response. Oh, yeah. Well, we had, we had him on on one D talks. On, on I know, one. I yeah, know. He was I... really good. Yeah, really, he was really really cool dude. Uh, and I love his stuff. And I, 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 it's not that I think what he does that approach won't work. I just don't think it's fully optimized. I think it's more optimal to do it the other way. Yeah, of course. Uh, what about the GH in the of season? And this one, especially, I've I've especially lately, just because lately, for some reason, some people start the things that is thickening your skin due to like an increasing of the of the um, mm -hmm. collagen uh, in the skin. Do you believe in that? And how high you will run the, the GH with your guys in the, in the off-season and if it's going to be higher or lower than in the prep? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like with most things, if you want to know, like one, like, what's it called? Do uh, when you take things to the extreme, it's a mathematical term, uh, add it, like you solve it ad infinitum, meaning you take it to infinity basically. And so with growth hormone, it's like the ad infinitum would be like an acromegaly, acromegalic, a giant, like Andre the Giant, someone who produces massive amounts of GH year round and see what adaptations their bodies have. And so people with acromegaly have their hands get really big and thick. Their, their feet are very big and thick. Their hips are wide and their torso tends to widen out even worse over time. And they basically look like Shrek. And Shrek was actually designed after a guy, I think his name was Maurice. He's the French angel. He was a wrestler from the 1950s who had acromegaly. And it's hilarious if, you, if anyone Googles this guy, the French angel uh, uh, Shrek, you'll see he looks just like Shrek. But you can see those adaptations, you know, it, it, like the, the soft tissues of the hands and feet and the soft tissues of the face and the, like the, the brow ridge and the nose, the ears and the mouth and the jaw will grow. Your, your teeth will space, space out. 
and 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 one of the other things is your skin does look like heavy and thicker you know and so that's the extreme now there's a big difference between having giantism or acromegaly and taking you know a couple of years of growth hormone a day so when does that shift really happen well it's probably happening all the time it's just when is it enough to make a physiological change and that i don't know but i do know from having coached people before gh use was really widespread the conditioning you have to get guys into today, especially at the pro level, is is leaner and and harder than it was uh, in the early two thousands, when everyone thought the body like late nineties and early two thousands, everyone thought those guys looked better and leaner. I can guarantee that the body fats are lower today, and I think the reason it doesn't necessarily look that way is I think their skin is thicker, uh, you know, and so it's a real tough decision because. Like without GH, you get those really beautiful physiques, like a Barry Demai, uh, you know, the, a lot of the guys, like all the, most of the guys, even uh, through the mid nineties, a Lee Priest, you know, uh, what you start seeing in the late nineties is like moderate GH use, you know, and that gets you like a Dorian Yates, uh, Nasser al Sanbadi, those guys, they were using it, but GH was outrageously expensive. And I think that's where it's most optimal. And I think the problem is, is now it's so easily available and yeah. so cheap. Guys are using doses that are now beyond the amount that that benefits, you know, because you'll always add size on it because that's another thing with acromegaly. Like the French angel is only like 5'8", but he was like 290 pounds because you just, you have all this thick tissue on you. And so your body weight's going to get higher. You know, like Dorian Yates is like 254 on stage and he was an absolute mass monster. We're now half the guys at the, at the USA's or nationals this year will be over 255 pounds. You know, amateurs all the time compete at 260 pounds, but they don't look any better. It's they look heavier. Uh, and so that's my, like, yeah, with GH, I think you have to, I think you get about, you get about 10 years of pushing the doses. So this is, I think, an important thing for people, actually. Look at, uh, like, uh, Ronnie Coleman, 1996 to 2006, and then his body starts falling apart, right? Look at Jay Cutler. When did he burst on the scene? 2001. By 2011, starting to fall apart. He tried to come back in 2013, and it just wasn't working. He had, you know, his, he lost his quad size. You kind of get that turnip look to your legs. You're, you lose your quad sweep. A lot of guys lose this muscle here, you know, the bicep brachial brachi yeah, radialis. Yeah that like that muscle just completely disappears which i think is like related to carpal tunnel type syndromes the compression on the nerves starts damaging that tissue a lot of guys lose their triceps a lot of older guys i think related to gh use what happens is you'll see guys this this uh right here along the rib cage you'll see like a little like tr like a staggering where it looks like their ribs are pulling away from the rectus abdominis mm -hmm. phil heath got those in later years greg kovacs had that really bad marcus rule had it uh, and I think those things are all acromegaly type side effects. And I think it takes about 10 years. And if you look, if you could find like, when did uh, big Rammy uh, burst on the scene, like 2004 ish, is I think when he really, idea. when he started really pushing things, really training hard. And now, uh, wait, no, no, he, no, I'm sorry, not 2004. He burst on the scene. It was like 2011, I think, because he started training in 2004. I can't remember, but uh, when he started doing doing really you well you say 2004 i thought 2014 i yeah that, yeah that wasn't, that wasn't so so long ago max yeah. i think but 10, it's about 10 it was ago. about it was about 10 years ago is yeah. what i'm saying and what and what what's happening to him right now look notice his triceps starting to lose his triceps yeah uh his waist is widening and so you it seems to be you get about a 10 year period roughly you know and it's not gonna be exactly 10 years of but course. it's somewhere in that range you can do king kamali he had the same thing um, uh, and you get about 10 years and, and since most bodybuilders, like bodybuilders reach their peak in the sport between about age 38 and 42. So I recommend if you're under the age of 30, use very minimal GH use. If you're over the age of 30, go ahead and push it because it's when, when you start getting all the negative side effects and stop looking good, it's going to be the very end of your career. But that's, that's kind of so my approach. What, what are the mild use and what are the pushing for you? Mild use would be only in contest prep uh, uh, and then like, you know, two to four, maybe five IUs a day. Uh, if you're over the age of 30, that, but say, is that not moderate or moderate? No, that's, that's crazy low for me. <laughs> oh yeah. That's only in contest. That, no, I'm talking like, you know, 24 year olds, you know, like there's no reason to, you, you know, that I'm talking young guys, because if you use more than that, by the time you're 38, 
you're going to already be getting those side effects. When you should be looking your best, your body's going to be starting to deteriorate. Now, if you're over the age of 30, five to t five values is kind of like year round. That should be your base, I think. Uh, and, which is really, um, I use not actual an actual measurement. It's uh, uh, it's about like three, about four four milligrams, three point five milligrams uh, per day. Uh, with and then you can go higher. Eight's probably a little better. The problem is once you get to eight, you start running into risk of insulin resistance, which you'll need like a GDA. And I recommend berberine. I actually recommend our product suppressor. 10 IU, you're almost definitely going to need it. But but in general, I say most guys, if you're over the age of 30, five IUs uh, year round and you know, off season and then 10 IUs in prep. Oh, I've almost never get off 10 IUs. Yeah. Year round, the, yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard because it's it's so cheap and easy available, and and yeah. it's not something you'll notice for you'll for for those first ten years you'll get better results. The problem is it, it happens quick. You don't even realize it. You like you. It's almost like you wake up. And you're like God. My like I'm having trouble with my quad sweep. You know, and guys get that look where their adductors are really big and they had no quad sweep, and it kind of looks like a turnip. And look at you'll see guys get that late in their career. They'll start having it's like, did I have nerve damage to my triceps? Why? And it's it's like one tricep starts kind of fading, uh, and their 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 midsection gets blocky, and then it just really starts piling up, and it and then it starts snowballing, and they lose their triceps, their midsection gets wider, the, they get really bad turn up legs, and you that's fine if that happens when you're 42 because then your career is over. If that happens when you're 32, you're fucked. I don't have that many times already. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and if, if like, and I tell guys, if you're over the age of 30, there's no risk because those things went by the time that stuff starts piling up, you're, you're on your, you're on your way out anyway. So go ahead and push it. Yeah. I'm 29. I'm, so I'm almost there. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're there just, but it's, it's, you just have to be like cognizant that probably if you've been doing that since 28, when you get to about 38, you're, you'll start noticing those things and there's nothing you can do then. And it sucks you know, because I've kind of had it happen, you know, and it's like, it's hard because it's like the stuff used to make me so full and round. Why, why are my arms not flat or not full at all anymore? Why are my shoulders not full? And that's kind of what happens. And you can say, like, look at Dave Palumbo late in his career uh, for how big he was. It's hard to find pictures of him, but if you can find a picture of Dave Palumbo in like 1995, he looks inhuman. And he was a good bodybuilder, you know, but by the time you see him in like 97, 98, 2000, he's very big, but his muscles are so flat. And it's this weird thing that seems to happen. And I think it's related to the nerve compression, the, the, that those nerves get compressed over time, like the carpal tunnel stuff. And they get compressed over time and parts of those start dying off. They no longer innervate, innervate parts of those muscles. So those muscles flatten out. Okay. So I, I think that's a, a lot of guys going to have to rethink their, their, their usage. Okay, you briefly touched the subject of the insulin, talking about your high days, but what do you think about insulin during the year of season? When do you use it? And what type of insulin do you prefer to use? Okay, this one, people, I, it's, I have to explain this right, because every time I, I think I explain it correctly, people misinterpret it. Most people, when they take insulin, they do this. They say, I'm going to take 10 IUs of insulin. That means I have to eat this many grams of carbs not to go hypo. That's the wrong way because that's not your diet. How do you know that's the right amount of food to eat? Yeah. So we'll, what I use is I use it on high days only. And if we have three high days a week, we'll use it three days a week. If we only get one high day a week, we only use it one high day a week. That, but that's it. We use it three on high days and we use it three times a day on high days. And I prefer only human log. I prefer to be precise with my measurements. And then what I do is we develop the high day. So we have your high day diet. It's this many calories, this many grams of carbs. We know you can utilize this. It's working. You're not getting fat. You can do this without insulin. Now we add insulin to that day without changing the day. And so now what happens? Well, if we add insulin to it, we already knew what was happening. We were already doing fine on that diet. Now, some of that glycogen or those carbohydrates that might have previously turned to fat a little bit, now with the insulin, they can be stored as glycogen. So you're going to have less fat storage. Now, some of those amino acids that were excess calories that might have previously been trickling into fat stores on high day, there's some potential that they'll be synthesized as new muscle mass because insulin increases the uh, rate of amino acid uptake into the cell. And so if you do it properly, insulin will actually keep you leaner. 
and it's not a dramatic difference, but a few calories of carbohydrates and a few calories of protein that would have been converted to fat before now have a pathway to be stored. They're still being stored. So we're not, nothing's changing. Just rather those calories being stored as fat, they're just being stored as glycogen and, and muscle tissue. And so you actually end up leaner. Okay. Do you ever use something like Lantus, like 20 no, forever? I don't, okay. I don't like it. And it goes back to, uh, I, I want my, my, I've done this long enough and I, I, I feel that you can do things uh, and maximize muscle growth because my guys are all, none of my guys that have been with me for years are competed under at anything less than 260 pounds. My guys are all big. So I know this isn't holding back size, but I also know that you retire at early in your early forties and you might have 40 years after that. I don't want you retiring a diabetic and that's like the Lantus. That's the problem. So, uh, like if like the standard way of maybe using insulin after your workouts every day, you know, and people think, well, that's what I want to do. Uh, uh, that uh, The reason I don't like that is say you do that five days a week. So five days a week, you're negatively affecting your insulin sensitivity almost every day for some period of the day. You're, and you're doing it around workouts and you think, well, I want to, I want that because I want to grow more for my workout. Well, how much faster do you grow with insulin? We know it's not double. Because it's not like you take insulin and now you grow twice as fast as you used to. Mm -hmm. But let's say it is double. Let's say you grow twice as fast when insulin's in your body. So say you take Humalog and it's active for about, you know, three hours, right? We know that the maximum amount of muscle protein synthesis you can get per hour is about one gram. So we get three more grams per day, right? Five days a week. So 15 grams. So that's 15 extra grams of muscle a week. So what's that? Uh, 15 times 52. Oh, 52? It's oh, 52. 780 grams, right? So one, like, like uh, two pounds of muscle a year difference. And we do all that to negatively, offense, in, negatively affect insulin sensitivity almost every single day of the week. Now, the way I do it, what do we do? We take it three times a day. And those laps, because oh, it's not like human log, it's really full, full active for about three hours, but it trails off for almost six hours. We're doing it every three hours. So really when it starts trailing off, we get the next peak and then, you know, those, and those early peaks, they cross that, that super physiological threshold together when either one of them by themselves wouldn't be enough, you know? So really what ends up happening is we get about 18 hours per high day where insulin is elevated. So the other way you get 15 hours a week. So, and five days a week, you're negatively offense, affecting insulin sensitivity with my way, only, even only one day a week, we get 18 hours of where it's working. And we're only affecting insulin sensitivity one day a week, you know? Yeah. And so if, and if we do it twice a week, if we have two high days a week. Now we have 36 hours. So I'm getting more hours every week than you're getting uh, every two and a half weeks. And I'm only negatively affecting insulin sensitivity two times in that period where you're doing it 10 times, you know? So I'm, yeah. I get twice as, twice as much per week or two and a half times as much per week. And I get, uh, one fifth as much days that I'm negatively affecting insulin sensitivity. So that's why I do it. And that's why I don't like Lantus because it's so long acting. And I've just, I've seen so many bodybuilders come to me after using Lantus three, four years and without the Lant, and they say, no, I'm fine. I, you know, I, my, my blood sugar is always perfect. I say, yes, on the Lantus. Once you stop taking it, it's not going to be perfect and you're going to need medication. And, and of all, uh, you know, in America, at least, uh, 50% of us are going to die of obesity related illness. And nearly every one of those people are going to have type two diabetes when that happens. So that's like a 50% death rate that I'm trying to avoid. And I, and I think you can avoid it with not only without any slowed rate of growth, but actually improved rate of growth. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. I have, uh, have got three more questions and this is the question that I recently had just because this is very tricky for some. So first question is going to be how high you like to keep your estrogen during the off season in your, in your athletes. A real like loose answer is as high as it, as you can without having any side effects, any risk of gyno because even, estrogen's is healthy. Even if it's three, three. That's why I say it's the it, norm. It's, that's, that's the caveat is uh, some people are so low risk for gyno that we actually do have to control it because it gets so high, but mm -hmm. If you're 300, 300, whatever, what is it? Nanograms per deciliter, picoliter? I can't remember that. I mean, is that standardized across the world? No, but, it's not. In, yeah, okay. in Poland, the range ends at the 33. Okay, let's say 33 is normal. If you are 
120. Okay, if you're 120, 60. yeah, if you're 60, I'm fine. And you don't, you're not getting gyno. Your bone density is going to be higher. Your blood lipids are going to be better. Your HDL is going to be higher. Your LDL is going to be lower. Now, the only issue is that it's going to be slightly harder to get very low body fat. Because when you get to very low body fat, uh, with that like hormone pr profile, your body's not going to want to burn fat as much in a deficit. But we fix that in prep. In the off season, that's not a worry. And that mm -hmm. keeps us healthier. Uh, your joints are better. You got more water on your joints. You're stronger. You don't feel achy. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's more side effect dependent. And it's very rare very rare that someone is so non-side effect that we'll see like three times the number. I mean, that hard, yeah, that, that does happen, but if that happens, then I'll, I will want to get it, you know, like down to double the normal range, but most people, you know, isn't that, aren't that most people have side effects before they get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. If, if not gyno, they're probably going to be a high blood pressure or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or at and least so that's like what a we'll crazy do. retention. Yeah. 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 And so we, that's really what we use is we, we, if you don't have any side effects, no high blood pressure, no crazy water retention, no gyno symptoms, let, let it go. You know, you know, even, even twice as much as, as the high end of normal. Okay. And if some are not actually that like a privilege to not have a gyno, yeah. do you use uh, AIs or better tend to use something like DHD derivatives to, to lower the, the estrogen? I used to prefer tamoxifen uh, or sometimes raloxifen. Uh, and I probably still do. Uh, I'm less strong on that stance since John Meadows' death because John was a big tamoxifen guy and tamoxifen increases the risk of blood clots. And I know at one point he, because he had, from what I understand, like I think his obtuse marginal, which is the bottom part of the heart, the left ventricle kind of in the back was blocked or had an issue. And I think that portion of the heart muscle uh, died basically like a mild heart attack. And that was no longer, no longer had contractility. So it wasn't contracting. And so I know at least at one point a clot formed in that part. And from, from everything I, I understand, I understand about his death. It appears that the same thing happened again. And so again, I'm always trying to do, I want to do, we have a set of things that we need to accomplish. You know, we need your estrogen in this range, blah, blah, blah. We need this. We need this. If there, if we can do all those, we could check all those boxes and, and, and it's a healthier option. That's so I'm always weighing all those things. So it used to be more tamoxifen, and, but I'm less uh, strong on that stance now. And so a lot of people I'll use, um, ar uh, aromacin, uh, if, if needed. Yeah. Okay. But or or uh, what I true. would prefer to do sometimes also is if we because because primobolin is my favorite uh, anabolic compound and that has a pretty strong anti-estrogenic activity. Yeah. So I if someone's really prone to estrogen and they really like DECA or something, I'll ask them. I'll say, look, I know you like DECA, you feel good on it, but if you take DECA, we're going to have to take um, you know an AI or uh, or an anti-estrogen. And we might even have to do something for your prolactin. Last time you took it, your prolactin got elevated. And I don't want you on cabrigaline or primapexil year round. So we're going to, at least we're going to have to do P5P or something. We're doing all these things is I know you like DECA, but given the fact that there's all these additional side effects, how about we try primobolin, you know, so we can keep your estrogen lower, you know, just that way. And I, I prefer to do that. And then maybe add like a provirin and if we need something else. And do you believe that the, the AI are actually what's causing the problem with your lipids? Or is that people have the tendency to just crush their estrogen when they use oh, them? Both, both. Because from what I understand, because uh, you like, like, and I'm not an expert in this, but like tamoxifen, like something that binds to the uh, estrogen receptor and, and doesn't activate it. you So you still have act estrogen in the bloodstream. It's just not able to find receptors to bind to. And so I think you get some of the estrogenic benefit when you're using that, even though it's not binding and activating all the receptors in the body. And I think there's some areas where it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, Dr. Todd Lee, we had him on podcast and he discussed this in pretty good detail. There's some areas of the body where it does still, is still able to bind receptors. It just can't bind to like the breast tissue area and stuff. And so you get like some of the estrogen benefit. Uh, but so it's, so it's a combo, 
because AIs lower estrogen so much that's going to kill your lipids. You know, you could theoretically lower your estrogen that much with tamoxifen also, and probably not destroy your lipids quite as bad because you still have a lot of free floating estrogen in the body. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, 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 uh, yeah, it's because one, an energetic blood profile is going to be hard on uh, lipids anyways. If you, if you're, if you have high testosterone levels, high DHT levels, your, your cholesterol is going to be high, especially LDL. Yeah, yeah. And then if you have low estrogen, that's also going to happen. And your HDL is going to be low. Yeah. Okay. And the, the last question is going to be managing the blood pressure. What do you do with your guys? Do you use something like uh, ARB or something like that? Or Any, not anything, like it? yeah, anything that'll get your blood pressure down first and foremost, because we're not, we're not doing, I'm not working with you with high blood pressure because that, yeah, that's what kills bodybuilders. We die from kidney failure, which stems from high blood pressure. So first and foremost, we're not making any progress anywhere if your blood pressure is high. So that's, you know, but I would prefer we got it down with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And I used to recommend lisinopril for years, uh, and I still like lisinopril. It's an ACE inhibitor, and I like it because I remember reading a couple studies that showed it actually increased IGF-1 uh, levels. And okay. so I was like, hey, if I can lower my blood pressure, I don't have to buy, uh, you know, <laughs> how much it raises. It probably raises it t- a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, but I, hey, I'll take what I can get. But right now, Telmosartan, everyone reads yeah. it. And so every client's like, well, I would rather take Telmosartan because I know that. So I'm fine with that also. Yeah. Yeah, just, or ACE I, I think it's just because the Telmosartan tends to help with your uh, like uh, insulin sensitivity and also like a PPIR activator. So it's yeah. just like a better for your lipids and stuff like that. But most of the time, people are probably going to use something like Cardarine or something like that. So... So I, uh, oh, do you use Cardarine or do you? I like Cardarine, yeah. 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 I don't, do you I stack don't... it with Tulmisartan or, or you take uh, it separately? Well, for Cardarine, I don't really use it for blood pressure. I use it for improving HDL. Lipids, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, some some people even think that this is like a fat burner, but obviously yeah, no I one take it, it to, in that per, for, for that purpose. I don't think it's an, I think it does affect because, it, you know, because it, it does lower other fats in the body. So I think there is some, pet, but it's, it's like, uh, just something can do something doesn't mean that it's noticeable, you know, yeah, it's, like, it might it's, act, it's like cinnamon lowers yeah. their uh, cholesterol and yeah, people yeah. eat the cinnamon cereal just because they are thinking yeah, 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 exactly. they it's yeah. <laughs> it might lower you know if it's burning a couple milligrams of fat per day that's great you know but over the course of an entire 16 week prep it's still less than a pound of fat you know but yeah i think car is like one of the few products that i'm really I, I like i don't recommend it like just automatically but that i do recommend it quite often and i see really improved hdls especially on it uh as far as blood pressure uh if an ARB or ACE inhibitor isn't enough. I tend to like a, a, a calcium channel blocker, like amlodipine. So then, like the the, the like the ACE inhibitor, they kind of get you on two ends of the kidneys. One of them's helping out on the like on the on the way into the kidney, and then like the the uh, calcium channel blocker is kind of helping on the way out of the kidney. So you, you you can kind of get it from both angles, and that's really what we're worried about is kidneys, because that's what every bodybuilder dies of. They die. They don't die of kidney failure. They die of like pneumonia or pulmonary edema which because they were in kidney failure their blood volume increased they they uh went into cardiac or, or uh congestive heart failure you know then they get dilated cardiomyopathy and then that that fluid eventually builds up into the lungs and they get pulmonary edema and they walk around you know complaining about they got they got walking pneumonia or something doesn't feel right they think they got a cold and they eventually die of that but it's all stems from the kidney failure that originally stemmed from the blood pressure so do whatever it takes to get your blood pressure down, preferably yeah. without beta blockers. But other than that, get your blood pressure down. Funny that this topic just came out like a maybe five, seven years ago. And uh, before people just worried about the liver. And yeah, well, <laughs> to be honest, driving... never seen He's... no anybody that dies from the liver and people yeah. dying like a flies from. Yeah, from from the, yeah and, funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, what cracks me up is. It used to drive me crazy because people that don't know anything about the body, they used to, when I used to tell them the low, they, they wouldn't want to lower their blood pressure because they somehow thought like the pressure, high blood pressure meant they were stronger. And I'd be like, no, that's not, no, you're killing yourself. You know, it's like, and they'd always worry that taking a blood pressure medication would slow their muscle growth. And so that's why I picked lisinopril because I'd be like, no, 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 look, not only will it not slow muscle growth, but it raises IGF-1. 
And now whether or not it, it does to any real level, it doesn't matter because people hear that. Uh, but what's funny is every, like bodybuilders can't do anything correct. We can't just do anything like normal because now everyone wants their blood pressure like as low as possible. I'll see people posting like their blood Maybe pressure. over 40. Yeah. I'm like, that's not good. <laughs> They're going to pass out, you know? It's like, no, there's a good range. It's, we, we just always have to go, oh, that's the right direction. Let me go that way as far as I can go. I don't know how, how it is in the U.S., but in Poland, there was a tendency just because we have a couple good guys here who are actually are uh, very no, no knowledgeable and they are starting to uh, like uh, watching over the, their, their blood sugars and they are posted mm -hmm. the, the scores, how the, the blood sugar should look like or if they are like uh, insulin sensitivity is great or something like that. Just 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 a stupid post or or just brief like a stories or something like that and then people just catch it and yeah. they are starting to rush it over themselves who's gonna have the lowest yeah. score oh my god and yeah people are 30, 33 look at yeah. this how my insulin sensitivity improves yeah, yeah. and Your stuff like that sensitivity is gonna crazy. be pretty high too yeah no that because I, i used to use blood sugar testing i used it like 15 years ago uh And my, my oldest daughter is actually a type one diabetic and I used to use it in peak week very, uh, but I, not for the reason that people think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I had to stop using it because clients don't know why you're using it and they don't know what a good, and so a client like, so when I start to see your blood sugar climb, it's like, okay, I know you're dried out now. Good. We're dry. Let now, now we'll get your blood sugar down, but we know you're dry. We don't have to take any diuretics. We don't, we, we are, we're there. We, we got what, clear clear test that proves that we're dry we're dehydrated and they would see a high number and they would panic you know and they would stress themselves the cortisol would go sky high and i'm like no no we want to see that i mean we, we don't want it to be high but that's that's our proof that you're dry now now we don't have to we're not pushing carbs anymore because it won't work we can't carb up anymore you know but people i had to stop using it because people would like stress they they'd read a number that was good and and stress about it because they didn't know what anything meant And so, yeah. and then same thing in the off season guys, because now a lot of people are using it and they'll be like, so coach, you want me to test my blood sugar before or after every meal? And I'm like, no, no, we're not testing every meal. I, like, I don't want to know what your A1C is, you know, but like, especially the bigger guys, like fat, like uh, if you're 270 pound off season bodybuilder, if you wake up in the morning and tech, you, anyone that's that big that want to try this, wake up and tech, test your fasted blood sugar. And then now walk around the house for 30 yeah. seconds or even just do this. Like do this with yeah, your arm. I, I just I just wanted to mention about it just because I have this this I see this tendency over and over again. People just don't understand how the human body works. So mm -hmm. they this, this often you send someone to do the lab works and he is not even drink a sip yeah. in the morning. And then the every score is high, every everything, yep. just because he is just dehydrated. And and for for some time, even the doctors say the physicians says to to the people, do not drink anything. You have to be fasted. Oh God! Yeah, this that's that's crazy. But but people still doing it. Yeah, well, and, that's the thing is, I mean, and I, I I don't I hate bashing doctors. That's a common thing in bodybuilding is we like to like say doctors don't know anything. Doctors are very smart. It's very hard to become a doctor. But the person who finishes last in the class is also still a doctor. And so yeah. you might get that person as, you know, you, you want to get the person who finished first at the best school, because they're going to know their stuff. But the person that finished last at the very worst school in the whole country is still a doctor. So I was, I was working with uh, one doctor who uh, is, was taking his, his thyroid medications for a couple of years right now. And he didn't know why why he have to bump it up the, the 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 amount of it every single time. But I'm just asking, how are you taking it? I just taking it with my meal in the morning and with my coffee, and this is just clears up everything. This is why you are just not absorbing it. This is like yeah. a T4 is like have like a very Uh, poor bioavailability with yeah food. yeah and so then coffee is remember <laughs> yeah, coffee is so acidic yeah. yeah empty stomach your your pepsin levels are sky high in the stomach yeah yeah yep yep yeah and it's and the thing is like like most of the doc most the doctors we 
see our general practitioners. They have to know a little bit about everything. And they don't, they don't, you have to remember, it's not their passion. You know, like you go in to check your blood work, you that's your passion, you know, bodybuilding. You so you like it isn't for them. It's their job. They have to know a lot about everything, but they don't go home at night like and get on the forums or on the chat boards or on the Instagram and and read about, you know, blood work, you know. They they have to know what they have to know, but it's a job for them, you know. And the ones who are really, really good go on to specialize things, but even then, it's still a job for them, you know. And so it's like like you can think about how much you know about the job you have to do versus how much you know about bodybuilding, which you love to do, you know? And so yeah. that's the to remember is, you know, a lot about a few things because it relates to your bodybuilding, you know, like no one really like, like if you ask the average bodybuilder, what happens if your alkaline phosphatase is low, they're like, uh, uh, but you know, they know what AST and ALT means, or they know if their creatinine is high. They know like, you know, the few bodybuilding yeah. things because they read everything about it. You know, the, the, the doctor has to know a little bit about every single thing. And this is why this uh, that's always funny for me when you uh, when people ask you just because you're a personal trainer or coach something is hurting me in my I don't know <laughs> ribs what could it be I don't freaking know I am a I don't coach. know broken rib <laughs> I am not a physician I am not yeah. a physiotherapist and and there yeah, are the... like people who are doing this every single day and this is why you should go to visit them yeah that's yeah. why i try to stick to what i like nutrition is my thing you know even hormones aren't really my you know like like anabolics and stuff i you know i went through my phase where i was interested and i learned about them but once i you know once there's not that much to learn and once you kind of do like like the jordan peters thing where it's like it doesn't matter i stopped caring and so like these guys are like come with these super detailed questions and i'll be like i look i'll give you my answer but it's not my area of I'm not passionate about that because I know it doesn't matter, you know. This yeah, is why like I'm my... not, not I am not doing a PCTs with people. Yeah. The, the the endocrinologist is this one who is supposed to be do this. Yeah. I could help you get big and run your cycle in a, like a moderate, moderate way. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to came off and bring up your your natural hormones and stuff like that, just go to see physician. I, I don't yeah. know anything about it. That's uh, I just got I just did a uh, Instagram reel where uh, it was from one of our podcasts where it was like, how do you what what like the fastest way to get big, you know, and get huge. And so I lay out all these things. And then all the comments are like, Oh, my God. So how am I supposed to have kids? What happens? You know, the, you know, you, you, so how's your blood pressure going to be when you're 290 pounds every and I'm like, that this wasn't they didn't ask me how to be the healthiest human on earth they asked me how to be the hugest bodybuilder on earth you know like, how do you not understand yeah. what people can't can't you know that all the comments are you know just all bashing and which is fine because i then it gets more views so i'm go ahead and do it but yeah of uh, course I, i love it i love it yeah okay uh, justin it's it is all is, is almost two hours right now so yeah. <laughs> I, i told I you if you're gonna be talking I'll, i'll talk about this stuff for, forever so. <laughs> yeah this is why i hope you're gonna find some time in the in the future and and we we can touch the subject of the contest prep and the peak week uh, and and what to do after just because this this stuff is, is very interesting especially when it comes to diet just because so many people doing it so wrong that sometimes yeah. you're can even believe that it's, it's not even wrong it's uh, even worse than wrong yeah. somehow <laughs> 21st century and people still believe in drinking alkaline water and stuff like that so yeah oh God, so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah well, well i even had an argument with that uh when uh uh because i said you know you know you can't change your blood ph if your blood ph changes by even 0.1 in either die. direction you die yeah and and then so one of the first comments was no -uh, no uh, look at this and they found some pubmed article where someone survived with 0.2 difference for like an hour before they died <laughs> like <laughs> so, see, come on guys people yeah. argue about anything this is this is crazy And yeah, the, the, this, the, 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 the next one is going to be probably like a four hours. So I can talk about, I mean, the, the hardest part about talking about bodybuilding is, is, is shutting up. So yeah, the, the, I, 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 I'm on it with you. It's, it's <laughs> especially when, when you, when you can talk with, with guys like you and, and 
I can probably uh, like ask a thousand more questions and people are still not going to believe uh, or to, to the answer of the first one. Yeah. And well, well I'll be curious. To, I bet uh, I'm, this is why well, I like what you're doing here because you're going to get all these guys and they're all going to say the same things roughly about how to get biggest in the off season. And you're going to get 50 guys who are experts in the field and they're all going to say one thing and everyone in the comments is still not going to believe them. Yeah, and the, this is this is uh, the majority time. This is why I, I I do this, just to just to see the point, but like that just just to make the point uh, rather. But but I still know that nobody's gonna believe it. Yeah, it's quite crazy. It's like yeah. it's mind boggling to me. It's the only I feel like it's the only sport sport in the world. Like if if uh, LeBron James, like when Tiger Woods gives golf advice. Everyone believes it. Yeah. No one says, no way. That, I have to do the exact opposite of what Tiger Woods says. Tiger Woods is lying. You know? But yeah. in bodybuilding, like any a bodybuilder gives advice and everyone doesn't believe it. Like Jordan Peters says, bodybuilding is so simple. It's so simple. This is why people have problem believing it. Well, that's a, well I have a, a million view video on TikTok of Dave Tate saying that basically. That bodybuilding is simple and people got so mad. Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard, but that doesn't change the fact that it's simple. Eat <laughs> meat and rice, train Bo really hard. Bodybuilding your... is like deadlift. It's so yeah. fucking hard because it's so fucking easy. It's yeah. just you yeah. just picking up stuff from the ground. Yeah, things you've done since you were an infant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is why no one can do it right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. I think we're just finishing up. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. And if anyone's just uh, still with us after two hours of uh, uh, <laughs> talking, please subscribe to the channel. Please check out the description box below, and you're gonna find everything when it comes to uh, contact with with the with the Justin uh, and uh, every social media that that's that I'm I'm find uh, on the internet. I'm gonna put it down there. Awesome. So, thank you yeah so thank you so much once again and if you wanted to say something this is your time right now uh if anyone's listening still i appreciate it uh if you want to uh our supplements first attachment uh we'll ship to poland shipping's pretty expensive we're working on getting a, a distribution center in the uk so we can better to distribute to the uh that whole area european union and stuff uh or if you want to catch me for coaching, troponanutrition.com. Uh, and a lot of people, they'll hear me on this and they'll think I only work with pro bodybuilders. I don't. I'll work. I'll, if I have an opening and you want to work hard, that's all I care about. And actually, the most enjoyable is creating the bodybuilder. It's easy to work with a bodybuilder. Creating a bodybuilder is, is much more challenging. So if you have any interest in working with me, I'll work with anyone anywhere in the world if I have openings. Yeah, great. So... Thank you guys for watching this and see you next time.